welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the podcast. And this week I'm delighted to get the chance to chat with Dr. Stuart Shipko. Dr. Shipko is a psychiatrist in private practice in Pasadena, California, and author of the books Surviving Panic Disorder, Xanax Withdrawal, and Dr. Shipko's Informed Consent for SSRI Antidepressants. Stuart has over 30 years' experience as a psychiatrist and an extensive background in the psychotherapies. He writes for Mad in America on issues relating to SSRI withdrawal, and he has a particular interest in the side effects and withdrawal effects of antidepressants and benzodiazepines, and the need for informed consent when prescribing. Uh, Dr. Shipko, Stuart, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today for the Mad in America podcast, and very excited and interested to get to talk to you and hear more about your work. Um, uh, to kick us off, really, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, you and, and your background and what it was in particular that led to your 30 year, year plus career as a, a psychiatrist. Well, I went into medicine. I, it's all I wanted to do when I was a kid was going to medicine. Then I went into emergency medicine and family medicine first. And then I went into psychiatry in order to continue pursuing research I did on psychosomatic medicine. When I was in medical school, I really actually didn't intend to be a practicing psychiatrist. Okay. And when we spoke previously, you mentioned that you'd had experience as a, a kind of humanistic or, or shamanistic practice. Uh, and I, I haven't spoken to too many psychiatrists that kind of have that on their CV. So, you know, I was interested to explore that, that part of your medical practice. It's not a part of my medical practice. I got to say, I mean, I, I, I suppose it was integrated, but... I don't hold myself out as a shamanic healer, but in the years following, I did an internship and then went into practice. So you could do that in those days, 43 years ago. And I've been interested in knowing about healing, not just drugs and cutting and stuff, but what goes on in the nature of healing. You didn't have an internet then. I hired a secretary to find people who were healers and, and arranged for me to contact them usually over the phone. And um, I, I was just curious. The, one, the place where I really began to get cracking was uh, in my own building in Boston. There was a woman named Ann Wigmore. Ann Wigmore was healing people through giving them natural foods. It's, she was growing them in her apartment. I got to know her pretty well. I watched her healing style. I, I so I drew a couple of conclusions. I concluded there was a couple of things I saw. One was that the person who wanted to be healed came to the healer and asked for the healing. And the second part was the, the healer was pretty confidently responded, oh, yes. I was thinking to myself, well, how do you know you're going to heal them? But the, the, that was part of the deal. And then you just got to do something with authority. I eventually started doing it with real patients. It was very interesting because I could say, of course, they'd ask for the healing. I'd say, yes, I can do it. But then what happened next, I didn't have any plan. It was different each time. It just sort of was very spontaneous. I had a, a, a fair number of interesting experiences. You know, it defied logic. You know, I mean, it just, you just had a couple of miraculous events. And I explored it. But it wasn't something I wanted to hold out on my resume. It's like, well, come by. I didn't think that was possible. That moment when you have to, after you say, I can do it, um, you don't want to be tied in by some sort of contract and stuff. And I, I think that the spontaneity, you need to be really loose. So, um, and I don't even do that kind of stuff anymore. But I had, I had a whole section of my early career where I did that kind of work. And uh, as you already know, I, I think I drew my personal identity from that more than other things. Because when you see what, what happens, what transpires in a healing relationship, uh, it always, that's the highest form of, of medical practice, even if it isn't medical practice. That's where I began to get my identity as a clinician 
Was there any conflict between what you were observing in, in people's healing practices with what you'd been taught about biomedical psychiatry? And, you know, and, and if there was conflict in those things, how did you reconcile that? No, I actually, they were different things, so they weren't really conflictual. Honestly, not only did I have no conflict with doctors who, like when I, they asked me to see somebody, they, were, they had doctors. When I contacted them, they had no problems with with anything either. So, uh, no, I didn't have conflicts. It was just something totally different, something doctors didn't generally do. It was a, a lay people thing. Thank you. That, that That's really helpful. And you've become known over time uh, for your interest in helping people and advising people who might be having a difficult time getting off various psycho psychotropic drugs. So, was there a particular time that you started to notice that people were having difficulty? You know, when, when, when did the penny drop for you or was it a gradual realization? Well, just to clarify, you know, my real expertise is with uh, SSRI antidepressants, not getting people off of all medicines. You got to go back in time and realize, so when there were the tricyclic antidepressants, there was a lot of debate about how quickly you should take people off of them immediately after they got better, maybe give them a month. But depression was defined as a time-limited condition that typically would go away on its own, even if you didn't treat it. And the idea of keeping somebody on maintenance ma medicine forever, well, that really wasn't, I mean, it was done, but it wasn't talked about. It, it was just sloppy. You took people off. So the SSRIs came out. I never prescribed them in the beginning. I like to watch and wait and see what's going to happen. But patients were on them and they'd come in and they were all, you know, way better. And they'd say, okay, well, it's time to come off your antidepressant. And they really couldn't and wouldn't. And it, it was a mess. Now, the second part about that is in my work on panic disorder, I posted something on my website about when you start taking an SSRI for panic, patients are reporting that they are having the worst panic attacks of their life. And I just let people know that th this is happening. And there were a huge number of people who not only had this, this problem happening, but all kinds of other problems. Uh, hundreds of them contacted me and showed up and I became a clearinghouse. They didn't even necessarily want me to, or, or they realized I might not be able to do anything. All they wanted to do was be validated. They weren't like this before the drug, they were afterwards. And they want somebody to say, yeah, that sounds like a drug side effect. And then the more that, the more people who came and the more I knew, the more I uh, was able to identify. Uh, so that's where it all started. Taking people off of medicines was what was done at the time. Yeah, actually, it wasn't until after the serotonin reuptake inhibitors came out that they relabeled depression as a chronic relapsing disease. And you know, I guess I didn't get the memo. So that I mean that, that's kind of where it all started. And then over the years, I've that has been a part of my practice. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I you know, I, I feel certainly having been involved in this world that I don't know too many like you who have an appreciation of the difficulties that people have when they try and come off SSRIs. And, you know, I wondered if you felt that, you know, the kind of lack of general awareness from prescribers about this, you know, is that just an accidental thing or, or, or is it, is there intent behind it to perhaps keep people on the drugs to, or to not frighten them, or is it a paternalistic thing? You know, why don't more doctors know about withdrawal and, and are equipped to help their patients come off? That's a really good question because it's visible. It's not like, you know, you see all these statistics and numbers. These problems are something that you look at and then for whatever reason, rather than calling it a withdrawal reaction, they label it as a new condition. Is it that they are afraid of malpractice and secretly are hiding it? I imagine that's a part of it. But it's my that quote by Sinclair Lewis is my explanation that it's difficult to get somebody to understand something if their livelihood depends on them not understanding it. 
I, I have to say that some of my worst experiences were just trying to speak with other psychiatrists about these matters where that was greeted with, you know, as opposed to the, you know, shamanic healing, talking about Paxil dependency made another psychiatrist raise his voice at me. I have to say it's, it's been a little bit difficult being on the outs because I think that everyone jumped on the serotonin bandwagon and, and felt they had to. You know, one interesting thing in that regard, there was a young man who had severe akathisia, really severe suicidal road rage. This guy wasn't going to last. He was already on a lot of benzodiazepines. I put him on even more. And it did calm him down. But because I felt uncomfortable about what I had been doing, and I asked him to get a second opinion as well. He did. And, and that doctor agreed with me that this was a medication side effect and that this was the proper treatment. Interestingly enough, his father is also a psychiatrist. And his father confessed, said, you know, I know that these are real problems, but I dare not say anything to people. So there, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of force making people support these. You know, in 2001, I was scheduled to give a lecture for grand rounds at a local hospital on adverse effects of antidepressants. And the audience was seated with agitators that wouldn't let me speak. They stood up and they screamed and they yelled. So, yeah, this has been something. This has been a problem. You know what else is a problem? I lost friends who felt like if they went on these drugs, somehow I would be judging them or, you know, angry and stuff. I realize I'm not that way, but, um, you know, people felt uncomfortable. And that's why, of course, I, I didn't do this conversation with them sooner. No, I, I understand. I'm, I'm just grateful that, you know, we can get to chat about these things. And what you spoke about there, Stuart, leads nicely onto the next question, which is about informed consent, because, you know, obviously, I, I think, you know, discussion of the potential for withdrawal is one of the issues that needs to be covered in that. And you've written a book specifically about providing informed consent when prescribing. So could you say a little bit about how you approach providing informed consent to someone seeking help and you know what are the key issues to cover and in your experience what's the result of that honesty and that honest discussion with patients actually that book was more written for informed consent for people going off of drugs but and it covers some really big things this is what you're asking about so the first thing i tell the person is you may never be able to get off this drug once you've started even if you take it for a very short period of time. These are things I've seen. I tell them that. I tell them that they may get sexual dysfunction that can be permanent. I tell them they may gain a lot of weight that they may not be able to take off. And I tell them that the drug can make them suicidal. I also add that if it does make them suicidal, don't take another pill. You don't even have to call me. It'll go away by the morning, which is part of it. But those three, those are the three big ones. You may, you, you may, this may be a lifetime experience and you may not be able to get off it. Even if you have side effects, uh, side effects may include huge weight gain and loss of sexual functioning. I start off there and add the suicide. I add that, you know, it can make you more depressed, makes a lot of, it can make you manic. I say that kind of stuff. And what happens is, oh, 80, 90% of the people say, <laughs> they kind of chuckle and say, oh, I'd rather not do that. And then you get maybe one out of 10 who's been on the medicine before and had a good experience and wants it again. Or somebody who's suffering and they're desperate and they want you to try something. Now, I know the audience is going to talk about, well, try psychotherapy. Medicine is filled with bad decisions. And this is a tough decision sometimes you have to make. And the medications for people who are emotionally overwrought, it can make a big difference and provide comfort. Um, I also tell them that the number needed to treat is six or seven. 
Um, I, I don't pull any punches. But like I said, um, sometimes you have to make a tough decision. They've had therapy. They can't stop crying. You know, you, you try um, in medicine. It's not just psychiatry. You, you try to alleviate that. So with conflict, I will prescribe to somebody who says they're really suffering. Even after informed consent, they still want the medication. And, you know, then, Stuart, what's your view about, you know, those situations where informed consent isn't really given? Oh, I think that there's the doctors are held to that. The doctors must give informed consent, merely giving the drug and saying, here, take this. The state of California, the medical board of the state of California doesn't think that that's OK. So I think the doctors have to give informed consent on these medicines. Even just a few things, it only takes you a few minutes. And if nothing else, tell them the drug can make you have suicidal thoughts. So if that happens, the person you know, knows to stop it. So I think for the most part, the drugs are being overprescribed and misprescribed. And I don't think anyone's giving informed consent but me, frankly. <laughs> Every patient has ever come in, I said, oh, did they tell you about this or that? No. That chimes very much with my experience. You know, my my own psychiatrist who I saw privately, it was a convincing job that they did to to say to me to take the drugs. And if I had questions about, you know, I didn't know very much at the time, but are they addictive? You know, how long will I need to take them for? You know, all of those concerns were airbrushed out of the picture. You know, it was just, no, let's let's get you established. And then subsequently, if I went back a few weeks later and said, I'm not doing very well on them, it it's not automatically, well, let's try something else or let's take you off. It's, well, let's increase the dosage, you know. And then when the dosage was the, the max, then it's, well, we'll add an antipsychotic or, you know, maybe we should add a benzo to it too. So, you know, I think that informed consent discussion is so vitally important because I think it could be the route out of polypharmacy for a lot of people. Well, with informed consent, it would be the end of psychiatry as we know it, that there would be no business for anyone. If, you told, if, a, if a child psychiatrist told every parent that there is no known literature to support the use of medication for your child's depression, they'd say, thank you very much and leave. And that's the end of your you know, money you make off of them, which I think is, is a large part of it, too. You know, back in the old days, a lot of these psychiatrists were starving, you know, like before the SSRIs came out, or even in the early phases of it, managed care changed everything because suddenly you could only go to people who were contracted. You couldn't just choose the guy who'd ask around, who's the best in town? You go, and people got used to, okay, I'll go to the guy on my plan. So a lot of the really worst psychiatrists ended up, you know, with huge practices, giving everybody meds and getting on all these panels. And so... It's been problematic. I mean, a lot of these are very weak doctors who are not very thoughtful. Now, that's not to say there aren't some guys out there who are really looking out for what's best for a human being. They're out there, but they're outnumbered by those who don't give informed consent. And that's, that's a problem. They don't even know what to say for informed consent, you know? Thank you, Stuart. And, and in the book on informed consent you wrote, you, you talk about the words used to describe the experience of coming off antidepressants. And in particular, you know, that using the, the term withdrawal might not be correct because we tend to think of withdrawal as a short-lived set of problems related to the amount of substance in someone's bloodstream. So the longer-term difficulties seem to have more in common with alcohol exposure and its effects on the body. So is there a better way of describing these difficulties than withdrawal or discontinuation? I feel like it's a, uh, a toxic phenomenon, that there's been some sort of damage to the nerve. It's not a receptor resetting. It's something structurally rebuilding, looking at the time course it takes. Um, so just when you lump it in with withdrawal, it makes it seem like you should go to a chemical dependency unit to get off of it or something. And it's not the case. So it's just a, it's a different type of uh, phenomenon. 
in a recent vlog you you wrote for MIA, which is was kind of what um, initiated this conversation. Really, you know, you you also talk about um, the length of time that people take to withdraw. And, you know, because there aren't any studies, because there isn't really ev any evidence on this, there's a, a kind of mythology out there that the longer you take to withdraw, the more it will reduce symptoms at the end of the, pro uh, end of the procedure. But you kind of related that that's not really been your experience. Oh, well, well, that has been. I mean, it's half of the equation. Um, and I'm the master of the super slow taper. It took seven years to get with one guy out, but some people can't get off of it. And even a low dosage reduction is too, too difficult. But for those who are able to tolerate small reductions, they'll be, have fewer symptoms as they're going off the medicine and have fewer symptoms right when they stop the medicine. That is true. But, the, but what that does not prevent is the recurrence of serious withdrawal symptoms at three to three, six, nine months. And those are so severe, they can be disabling. They're often disabling um, if untreated. And uh, people are highly suicidal due to the discomfort. So even if you do a really slow taper and a person has a, an easy ride off the drug, that does not seem to prevent what might happen later. One of the commonest things people do when they would show up in my office uh, with ha having gone off the drug and having maybe read on Mad in America about this or something, the commonest complaint was shame. Shame, oh, I should have known better. I tapered too fast. And they, they blame themselves for this. And that's, we can help everyone listening that the long-term outcome is not really affected by going off rapidly. And, and Stuart, you know, what, what kind of approach would you take if, if somebody turned up to you and, and they were maybe three, six, nine months off and, you know, saying, I suddenly have these unbearable symptoms that seem to have come out of nowhere? Is there anything that can be done to help? I mean, basically, you got three options. You can try and wait it out if it's tolerable. Um, you can try to slowly or quickly reinstate the medication. Uh, or you can try and dampen the symptoms down with a benzodiazepine, which if it's not too bad, you can get away with doing it intermittently and avoid dependency. But sometimes uh, you do have to give it regularly because the the, otherwise it's just intolerably uncomfortable. So you got those three options. And it's up to the individual what they want to do. For some people, taking another pill of that poison that causes problem is unacceptable. For other people, they're raising a family, they gotta get back to work. Their situation is unacceptable. So it's, it's a preference. I would, I would give them the three options and see what they wanna do. Uh, of course, uh, I always talk about healthy living, eating regular, people really feel that exercise helps, uh, something spiritual helps. So I talk about those things. But I find that, you know, in terms of the basic symptom, core symptoms, those three options are what you're looking at. Absolutely. That, that's helpful. Thank you. And in this most recent blog, you, you wrote about tardive akathisia, and you've kind of touched on this already a couple of times. So for, for listeners, that's sometimes described as an excruciating compulsion to move or, or an inner or outer restlessness that people can describe as a living hell. So I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what you found about the relationship between tapering and this delayed onset akathisia. Well, it shows up. I mean, it can show up at any time during the use of these medicines. It shows up in people on stable long-term doses of the medicine. Um, but it's much more likely to show up after stopping it. Um, and then, like I said, at three, six, nine months after the last dose, this will emerge fairly suddenly, usually in like as, as if it's an overreaction to a stressor. And you can see how it would affect somebody, but not like that. It's almost like uh, an alarm goes off in their brain or something, or a switch, switch is changed. Uh, so it's a, it's a very rapid onset. And is there anything that we can say about the prognosis for, for people who 
experience that you know is 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 there a general but slow trend for people to recover from that gradually well for the people who decide to do nothing yeah um it can be a slow gradual process could take months could take years um but waiting it out is a slow gradual process and the duration is totally unknown the best prognosis if you need to get rid of the symptoms which is most people do reinstating the medication, uh, which usually you want to give a smaller test dose because occasionally it, it backfires. And when you reinstate it, it makes things worse, but that's not very common. And the prognosis, in my opinion, if, if you reinstate the medication, the prognosis is you know, about uh, 90% of the people are going to get, get back to baseline. Another thing I want to mention is that Sometimes people get back to baseline on reinstatement right away. And sometimes people, it's, it's going to take a couple of weeks or months. Occasionally, you need to give more medication than they were on previously to get them back to baseline. But the prognosis, if you want to, the symptoms, if you need to get rid of them, most people are going to be able to uh, feel significantly better by reinstating. That's helpful, thank you. And and also, I wanted to ask Stuart. You know, I, I've 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 talked about this issue with with some people, and you know, they've said that they've gone to their doctors and said, look, you know, I I appear to be suffering from akathisia, which is related to a drug that I that I took. And the doctor's response is, no, it can't possibly be the drug. It's another condition. It's Parkinsonism, or it's 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 a movement disorder of some kind. And you know, they end up then medicated for some other problem. So you know. I, is there any way we can advise people to perhaps broach the subject of akathisia with their doctor when they tell them about it? I will. I just want to tell you that there also there is an increasing awareness, believe it or not. I mean, physicians are increasingly aware of akathisia as a side effect of all the psychiatric medicines. So that's changing a little bit. But it's never easy to go to your doctor and tell them what you think your diagnosis is. They get, they get offended. I think maybe suggesting, wow, you know, I read about something like this. I said, I wonder if this could be it. You know, I guess you have to approach them in a very deferential way, a very paternalistic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I recall that I, I won't name any names, but I recall a, a particular quite well-known doctor saying to me that antidepressants do never, ever result in akathisia. It's only dopamine agon antagonists or agonists that do this. So, you know, he was so convinced that he was right. And yet, you know, I, I, I've had people explain to me that it came from SSRIs. Yeah, but it's also in the manufacturer's information from early on. It's not, that's not hidden. What's hidden is that it comes can come on after months after stopping it. I want to mention another thing about reinstating so people will be listening, that um, the longer you wait to reinstate, the more likely there are to be problems. So usually there's no problems if you're reinstating within weeks or a couple of months. But beyond that, it gets it's not necessarily going to have that same good prognosis I mentioned. But I have just to say, I have the longest out was a two a person who had been suffering for two years before reinstatement and did okay but i've read about other people who've done on the internet i've read about people who've done that and it's not worked okay so i'm concerned about people just you know people are not getting a physician support on how to stop they're just going going on, on their own and i'm afraid something like this might give people the idea well they are on their own aren't they but to give them the idea that, that i'm advising them to go off the medicine i'm not it's a risky proposition no absolutely and you know we're, we're very clear that you know discussions on this should be between the person and their prescriber preferably the initial prescriber that prescribed in the first place but you know you're right Stuart. you know that there is a gray area there where people do have to self-support because they're prescriber won't listen or you know is is adamant that the, the drugs are a for life thing and there really is no reason to come off and i think if if a person is empowered enough to make that decision they should be supported in that decision but that unfortunately that's not always the case yeah i mean what happened we used to take people off of drugs now we don't take them off you put them on it seems like everything right you only go on more drugs once you touch one it leads to another one and it's not just psychiatry but Psychiatry is particularly bad. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I, you know, I, I have a number of friends who, you know, their one psychiatric drug maybe an antidepressant they took. You know, now it's led to a 
proton pump inhibitor because they've got stomach issues and they might need a tablet to help them sleep and they might need it, you know, and they, they kind of get on this prescribing cascade. But what seems to be the basis of the discussion then is how should we modify your dosages to get you in the right place? It's hardly ever a case of, well, let's go back to basics and, you know, where did this all start? Oh, yeah, and that can often be so simple. A lot of times people, especially to their family doctors, they have a discernible conflict in their life. The media has made people wonder whether they have a chemical imbalance. So if they're feeling sad and unhappy, they may go to the doctor wondering, is this that chemical imbalance? And the doctor will probably give them something. So to kind of, you know, wrap this up, we've, you know, we, we, we've kind of been talking quite a lot about various issues with antidepressants. So, you know, if, if you take into account perhaps the fact that they're, they're not the most efficacious of drugs, the possibility of adverse effects, the potential for difficult withdrawal for people, particularly after long term use, you know, what? What can we conclude about the use of antidepressants for mental health problems? You know, it, it is taking them worth the risk, do you think? In general, no. In general, it's not worth the risk. The effect on our society as a whole is a negative one. There may be some individuals whose life experience is more enjoyable because of the medicine, but on a whole, I think there's more going the other direction, particularly as people are on them more and more years. The pills are themselves neither good nor bad, but like you said, informed consent has to be given. You know, just to end on about that informed consent book, the pharmaceutical companies put out a ton of false data, and then they for, force people of honor to show that their data is invalid. They're always leading the waltz and you're dancing with them. But so I decided I wasn't going to do, I mean, I think surviving panic disorder was the same way. I just felt like I'm not going to sit down and try and be another fool presenting numbers. No one will believe me, even if they're right. I am going to use my voice as a clinician. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it's more or less, but this is my, this is my experience. Take it, take it or leave it. And my feeling is that's so much more powerful than trying to play around with numbers and all that. Just this is what I see, you know, take it or leave it. So I'm very happy with those little books. I think that they, they, they pack a lot, of, a lot into a small space. Stuart, you know, it's been such an interesting chat with you. And, you know, I, I, you know, I have so much respect and admiration for your efforts to help educate on important things like withdrawal effects and informed consent and you know I, I i wish we had more like you you know i i am so grateful for your writing on mia but i think what i'm most grateful for is your honesty you know i i on this i feel we need so much more honesty at the point of prescribing of these drugs and you know i i thank you so much for that so thank you so much for your time today too you're very welcome so i'm glad you're doing this and uh, i think that these efforts are actually having an effect I do too. Well, I just want to thank Stuart so much for taking the time to chat. And if you'd like to know more about his work or to find where to purchase his books, you can visit his website, which is stuartshipco.com. So as always, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates. 